Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What's happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He is the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to talk about in the land of movies, TV, comics, and more. You are tuned into the entertainment edition of the ODPH, and we definitely want to interact with you. So make sure to swing on over to odphpodcast.com. Join the conversation on the social media accounts. Check out Parlay Points. New blogs dropping this week. Might have some late reviews swinging through there, so you definitely Ooh. want to keep your eye out for it. Yeah, we got a late email that arrived, so I definitely want to take a gander at it after the show. This is how we do it, folks. We keep it very live and up front with everybody as well. Make sure to check out the T Public Store, check out the classifieds, the directory, all that is. The ODPH is right there at your fingertips, so you definitely want to make sure you get familiar. And always remember to use the hashtag ODPHPod on social media. Kicking off this edition of the ODPH, though. We have to break down the latest from the best show on the CW. Without question, Superman and Lois has been setting the benchmark that I think a lot of us fans have been missing since early Arrow. Yes. I would say that's probably a fair statement. Even the Flash seasons one and two. Flash season one, season two. Flash is hit or miss, but Superman and Lois has been so good, so consistently. It's been awesome. Yes, and there's no sophomore slump. In fact, they're taking some chances which I'm applauding them for because usually that second season, at least with the CW formula as we interpret it as, yeah, the second season is always like the season. Oh, yeah. And they're following in suit, but it seems like they're kind of pushing the envelope a little more because they're deep diving into Superman's rogues gallery. Yeah, they are. Which I absolutely love. And the other side stories involving the characters in Smallville have definitely started taking on a life of their own, which I really like to see. And it's not so much fo- focused on Jordan and Sarah. Yeah. We're getting a lot more characters involved. I'm loving this. And, of course, Tyler Hoechlin and Elizabeth Tolick have been absolutely crushing in the roles of Clark and Lois themselves. So we have to recap the latest. And I, I can't stress this enough. If you're not familiar with Superman and Lois, you need to get familiar on HBO Max for Season 1. Yep. Season 2, you can watch on the CW app. And you definitely want to get familiar because once we start talking about Episode 6, entitled Tried and True... We go into spoiler territory. So if you don't want to be spoiled, we're going to tell you to pause the episode here right now, catch up on the show, and then jump back in the conversation. Because once we get going, we don't like to stop. So you've been fair warned. So in three, two, one. Pad, what did you think? This is a great episode, all things considered. A lot of a lot of development with the story. A lot of boneheaded fucking decisions, but we'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but overall, it was a great episode. I have to agree. This was one of their better episodes. And not to say they've had bad ones. They've, yeah. they've had a couple fillers here and there. Let's, sure. let's be honest. But every single TV show does. I don't think there's one that's had a perfect start to end in a season. No. And this one definitely captured a lot of what's going on in town. Because we know the main plot of this season thus far is Clark has been fighting with the U.S. government. Yep. And kind of questioning, is it truth, justice in the American way or truth, justice in a better tomorrow? Well, and, and, and on top of that, or kind of like a side piece to that, dealing with the U.S. government while also not having the protective barrier of his father-in-law in charge of like the main faction of the army that deals with him. So now you've got a U.S. army that is still, despite however long he's been Superman at this point, because there's no been no clear defined He's been Superman and the world has known about him for X number of years. Like, mm-hmm. we don't know how long it's been. But regardless, the government and the army without his father there are very skeptical of him. Right, because he is the most powerful being in the universe. So, yeah. in, in their universe anyway. So, they definitely want to make sure that he's in check and there's nothing yeah. that they would perceive as a world-ending threat. Because as we've seen in such great video games as Injustice, a Superman gone bad is very bad for everybody else. Yeah. So this season, they've been focusing on that back and forth between them. Also, going in, talking with uh, having a rogue like Bizarro be your main rogue. Yeah. Which I applaud them for. Yeah. Like, that's that's a stretch. They they threw the curveball at everybody because we thought we were going Doomsday. And it was like, where do we go from here? Like, yeah. Would they really go that storyline? But no, but the Bizarro storyline, I have to admit, 
I've never been a big Bizarro fan before. Uh-huh. I'm loving what they're doing here. I liked the portrayal they did in Superman, the animated series, but of course, I caveat, I was a kid then when that came sure. out. So I love the story, and I love seeing Bizarro on TV because it was so night and day, and it was, it was funny to me as a kid, but like the character's always been super interesting to me, but I was always like, okay, I'd like to see him in some sort of role, but I don't know how, you know, until they decided to do a TV show, I was like, I don't know how you do the role bizarre because it's not necessarily a role big enough for the members of the justice league to show up. But like, unless you, you partner him with the league Legion of doom, you know, but on his own, it might work, but not necessarily for the big screen. Small, the small screen television screen is the perfect uh, forum to present him. And they're doing oh, it, and they're doing it in such a masterful way. It's awesome. And I, and it's good exposure because he is one of Superman's more well-known uh, villains or rogues, but, yeah. but also doesn't get that much shine. Well, you have to think about it with Superman, and this is one tough thing about a character, too. When you reach a power level like Superman, yeah. where you're the strongest being in all of the Earth and most mostly the DCU. Yeah. I mean, there are some characters that are stronger with that, and it's well said. It's tough to give a rogue to him that can really threaten him. Sure. I mean, that's the one thing that like Lex Luthor is very unique as being his main rogue. Sure. Because he's a mortal. He is a he's a regular man. Yeah. It's just he's smarter than everybody in the room. And like that's the crazy thing with him. And then you have Brainiac who's an alien yeah. who takes that to a whole different level for different means. Yeah. And then you think about okay, who's been able to match up with him physically? Doomsday is one that jumps right out Doomsday at you. Doomsday should be the first one on your mind. Right. But then there's there is a drop off. And it's no fault to anybody that's ever written Superman. No. It's just you look at that echelon of like his his rogues gallery compared to like a Batman or a Flash. Sure. There's a distinct drop off because of how powerful he is. Albeit though, in more recent years, they've been really trying to up that game. Like we've seen Zod now coming yeah. to the comics and, yeah. and so forth. So to see Bizarro, who's always been a C lister at best, really get taken in this portrayal has been something. And Tyler Hoechlin, who's been doing double duty as him, yeah. has really sunk his teeth into this role. And the only gripe that I've had, and I've said this before, I'll say it again, we don't have the backwards talk. Yeah, it's, I, it's I, fine. But it makes me sad. But I need to hear it at some point. I just like, give me a line, I'll be, I'll be good. Because as this episode kicks off, we get to see life in Bizarro Land. Yeah. Which is weird. Not going to lie, um, we see a character outside of a, uh, outside of a house and but we don't see who it is. We just, it's like from the feet and it starts scrolling up. And I gotta admit, I saw that suit and I saw what looked like pink or purple circular lights on that damn thing. And I thought it was Brainiac for a minute. And I started going, wait, wait, wait. Uh oh, are we are we doing what I think we're doing? But it wasn't. That would have been a hell of a swerve. Holy shit! I thought like legitimately it was three circular like pink or purple. It was hard to tell because there was this red hueish light going on. But they were close to purple in color, and they were in a triangular shape. And I'm like, oh, fuck, are we doing legit Brainiac right now? Yeah, and you do see Bizarro's story about how he uh, was basically fighting with his own government as well. Yeah. And you did see that he was fighting Ali or his version of Ali, the cult leader. In a red sun, too. Yeah. Red sun, and he was huffing kryptonite or some shit. It's a crazy thing, but his powers are flipped compared to what our Superman is known for. Yeah. And then you see that point where he jumps in with a suit. Yep. That we all think is Doomsday and how he crashes into the mountain. That's how you start. I did like how they did. The music was very haunting with it. Yeah. Too. That yeah. Was, that it, was, it was very off-putting. Yeah. But it works, though. And it was something that I don't know if Amy Jo Johnson, who was directing the episode, really took a you know a, a very unique vision with it and ran with it. But I applaud her for it. Yeah. Because, you know, this worked because you have to really establish Bizarro as being different. Because otherwise, you just kind of see him like, oh, well, he, he does everything backwards from Superman. Well, and to this point, we really don't know why he's there or how he came to be there. We just know from the little, you know, last shot of the one episode where he, where he told Superman what he had to do. Mm-hmm. So we're now, this is now the, the, what, sixth episode of the season. And we're just now kind of getting some backstory on why the hell he's here and what the hell's going on. So it was more than more than due. Yeah, which I do like. And, you know, they gave you enough, but they still gave you a lot of questions. Because what he's been doing is Bizarro has been telling Superman, like, hey, if Allie gets both of these pendants, right, that she is going to become literally a god. Yeah. To what extent, we don't know. But he said, basically, it's going to be the end of the universe. Which you, is not good. No, it's not good. But... You also have to take Superman and how he's processing this with a grain of salt, too, because right. he's like, 
sure, you're telling me your side of things, but this is, is this all adding up? Right. And he's hearing this from a guy that to this point has been wreaking havoc, whether directly or indirectly, purposefully or not purposefully wreaking havoc on his life and tried to beat the shit out of him a couple times. Right. And he killed two U.S. soldiers in the process. But he did explain it. No, I know. In, in, in such a bizarre way, they attacked me. He's not wrong. Yeah, like he spoke very robotic. He's like, they attacked me. Uh, well, what about this? Well, they did it first. <laughs> like He's not wrong. Yeah, but that, that's the whole thing about it. Like he's he's acting very misunderstood, which I like I said, the portrayal has been on point. Like this is such a fresh take on him. I'm all in. I'm like, okay, let's see more of this. So this is also causing some problems with the government like we talked about and, yeah. and Lieutenant Anderson, who's yeah. the new General Lane and, yep. and how that's all shaken out. I mean, that's just kind of a wild scenario in Getting its own his right. Butt hang out hung out to dry. Listen, we got two dead servicemen under your watch. We got no idea where this threat is. You need to fix this shit or your ass is grass. Yeah. Ian Bowen is playing uh, Lieutenant Anderson, really demonstrating that point, though, in every scene, because he is now facing the truth that Superman is not his ally. No. And basically this idea he has in his head where everybody should just listen to him because he has a title is not going over. No, and, and it's a relationship that, much like any relationship, whether it's friendly or in a romantic sense or in a work sense, it's give and take. You know, you have to take some and give some. You know, it can't just be the uh, the other side. You know, it can't just be Superman doing everything from Like, you need to give Superman a reason to trust you and to be willing to help you. And to this point, you're not doing it. You've taken over for his, fa- for his father-in-law, which is fine. That happens all the time. Sure. You know, but you turn around and, oh, you're you're excavating the ex-Kryptonite from the caverns in Smallville out from under their nose, turning around and turning uh, servicemen and, and a service woman into basically light versions of Superman. Yeah. And and not telling him about it until he, discover, he sees them right in front of him. I'm sorry, in the list of things that would really piss me off if I'm Superman, that's probably top of the list. Oh, absolutely. But everything that they're trying to do, because they're coming to the realization that he is not going to listen to what they're saying. And rightfully so. Superman has always been for the people of Earth, never been the people just of the U- U.S. Right. And I think that for Anderson, like, his vision is just so out there yeah. that... He's he just can't handle it, and it's such crushing to his ego that he's by any force he can do, trying to make Superman really accept his role with the government, and it's just not going to happen. And as we see later in the show, I mean, this comes to one heck of an end, uh, ending for that Oof. idea. But then we jump into what's going on in Smallville, and obviously with Lana Lang and her estranged husband, Kyle, right now. Awkward. Well, this is what happens when you do politics, and this is something yeah. that it doesn't matter where it is, if it's a small town or yeah. big city. It's Politics are the dirtiest thing in the game. Well, you, and the kid's getting dragged into it, too. Yikes. Right, right. Well, obviously, when you're doing, you know, extramarital you affairs. So you're cheating on your wife. Exactly. Like, stuff's going to get messy, and people are going to find it. But, I mean, Kyle, who's played by Eric Valdez, and Lana, who's played by Emmanuel Kirky has been doing a really good job yeah. with this. And like I and I love how Lana's getting some more screen time about this because I, she's trying to act very strong in front of her daughter, but then it just has those breakdown moments. And not rightfully so, like the emotions are there. Well and, and especially that like Lana's trying to stay strong and she's trying to give the answers to her daughter's questions without really upsetting them. Mm-hmm. Because Lana herself is, you know, for as much as she's putting on a face and putting on the demeanor that she has everything figured out and, and it's just for her daughter's purpose that like they don't freak out. She has no idea what she's going to do. She has no idea what to do given the situation. But when the one daughter asks, will we see ever see dad again? And she, and she don't, I don't think she answers. She's like, you know, maybe. And I'm just sitting there going off. That's, yeah. that's heavy. It is. And I mean, obviously when their story kind of wraps up at the end of the show, Lana makes the decision after she confronts the the other woman. Boy, that didn't go the way I thought it would. Uh, yeah, that was a little more calm than I thought. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, listen, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Facts. Uh, fucking hell. Yeah, that was a little more laid back than I thought it was going to be. Because wasn't the scene like she went to the bar yep. and without the bartender seeing you, oh, what can I, can I get you a drink? And Lana goes, no. And the bartender turns around and didn't it go to commercial right then yep. and there? And I went, oh, fuck, we're about to throw some fists. Yeah. But they actually had a civil conversation, and Lana got some answers from 
the other woman that she needed. Well, because she knows she's not going to get a straight out answer out of Kyle because Kyle's going to do and say anything to get back in Lana's good graces. So she wants she wants to get a straight answer. She's going to get an answer out of the woman who's most afraid of her. Right yeah, now. exactly, and, and rightfully so. And Lana does take the information and ultimately decides to kick Kyle out of the house. Yeah. So can't it, say I blame her. No, you can't blame her at all because I mean, Lana understands the situation. She reads the, the temp in the room. So. Yeah. I had no argument about this. I thought it was some strong acting, too. Oh, yeah. I, I really thought they, they've they been handling this whole side storyline very, very well. Yeah. So I definitely applaud them for doing that. The other side storyline going off, though, the MVP of this show, one Jonathan Kent. hey I tell you what, Jordan Elsass has been doing some amazing things on this show. And this has been a fun thing seeing him uh step his game up yeah physically and literally here on the show because we do see now that he is hooked on that mysterious vial which i believe they announced was x kryptonite i think that's what they're going with yeah oh okay i that might be one thing we'll have to see how this all plays out if that is true yeah because i still am trying to do the the biology of what's going on because well he has Kryptonian DNA in him. How does this all play out? Well, I mean, it could just be like it's a latent power thing. It's a genetics thing, and that the kryptonite is much in the way that green kryptonite takes away powers or kind of lessens powers. This might amplify them a little bit, mm-hmm. you know, or awaken them. Yes, because now Jonathan finally has his chance to be the starting quarterback. Yeah, because the guy who normally starts, I believe, they were going with was sick, but come to find out, his mother found the inhaler and found out he was doing drugs and well his ass was grass yes but we do see jonathan put on a game yeah he does much like tom brady back in the day goddamn right he does so if you had him in your fantasy football lineup oh you had a good day oh yeah you did yes so this was a very cool sequence to do i mean like i say so sometimes we i don't mind when they take a break and they no. go to the high school with this well and I, was, and I always appreciate a decently shot football game on television just because there's a compilation video, whether I can't remember if it's on YouTube or Twitter, but there's a compilation video on the internet someplace of actors playing football, and it is some of the most atrocious form and technique I've ever yeah. seen. That it's 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 just bad. This was actually pretty damn good. Yeah, they were on point with this, and it was a fun little thing too because obviously yeah. Jonathan wanted to impress his aunt who was in yeah. town. Yeah. So Jenna Dewan came back as Lucy. Yeah. Uh, surprise visit, so definitely happy to see her back. Yeah, surprise visit. You know, uh, what was it? Clark went to take the boys to school, and, you know, he was excited that he found out uh, Jonathan was going to start the start the football. He goes, oh, let's talk about it on the way to school. So Lana goes outside, sees her dad, and goes, oh, I'm surprised you're here now. And Clark just left. He goes, I know, I did that deliberately. And he steps to the side, and Lois's sister is there because, and and I appreciate the shit out of this, because while yes, this is a television show, this yes, this is based off of a comic, you know, this is Superman and all that. This is a real life thing. You got two siblings disagreeing, and you've got the father trying to bridge the gap between them, going, "Listen, I'm retired. I don't want to have to deal with mm-hmm. this for the rest of my retirement. We're gonna hash this out, hash this out now." Yes. So that was an interesting sequence of events because obviously Aunt Lucy was very happy yeah. to uh, be supportive of her nephew. Knows and, her shit about football too. Oh yeah. my god! Kudos to her too Holy as well. Holy shit! They come, you know. So she has this whole discussion with her with her father and and Lana or not Lana Lois. She sees, oh, look at how big the kids have grown, and and then br- the bridge kind of starts to get built back together. The boys come back, Clark comes back. They go to the, f- they come back from commercial break, and they're talking about like routes and what you do on second down and third down. And I'm like, yo, yeah, I was all in about this. I was like, okay, here we go. I know who I'm getting my fantasy football advice from. Yeah, you are seriously. So this was a little fun sequence because obviously what's going on in the stands uh, is going to be the drama that's going to be yeah really carrying over throughout the season, and I and. If Lucy's hanging around the show, I don't have any issue with that. No. I think she's had a nice dynamic with her and Lois going back and forth about Allie. And then we catch up to the post game where Jonathan is in the locker room talking with Candace. Who, who's all over him. Yes. Good Lord. Yeah, and of course, the talk of the inhaler comes up. Yeah. Jordan now catches it. Yeah. And then Jonathan has a little bit of... um. Can we call it roid rage? Yeah. Because they yeah. start going at it, which I have a feeling before it's all said and done, 
Jonathan's going to wind up with powers. I think so. Like, I, permanently. I think so. I, I think, much like I said earlier, I think this is going to be, like, some sort of awakening of his powers. That like, it's like a genetics thing that, like, they're there, just they're, like, the not the, they're not the dominant uh, genetics in his body right now. They're the recessive ones, and, like, it's going to do something with his DNA and flip it so that they're the dominant genetics. Yeah. But I'm still holding out. I hope it's it's Bane Venom, so he can be like. Unless they've, I was born air- in a dog, <laughs> molded by it. Unless they've turned it from a liquid to a gas, which maybe they've done in the comics. I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm thinking it's the kryptonite. Yeah, it probably is, but still, I'm holding out on my hope because we can do some crossovers. We can have some fun with this one. But they're building up their drama. But Clark is not there to bail everybody out. He catches wind of something going on on the other side of the world. In Avalanche? Yeah, well, no, because well, the Avalanche takes place while he's at the funeral. Uh, oh, that's right. They finally have the funeral for the two servicemen, and it's a full military funeral in Arlington. I believe it's Arlington National Cemetery. I think so, too. They didn't show up, but they were kind of playing it It was off. alluded to. It was alluded that it was Arlington National Cemetery. You know, and, and the mother of one of the servicemen comes up to him, and, you know, all, he, he wanted to be a hero just like you, praising Superman, this and that. And then Anderson comes up, and she practically beats his ass. This is your fault. He's dead because of you, blah, blah, blah. And then it comes out. Superman tells Anderson, because Anderson's like, hey, we got, listen, we got to put this bear the hatchet. We got to find this guy. We got to stop him. And Clark goes, yeah, by the way, I captured him, and I have him in my custody. You what? You couldn't have told me that or couldn't have said Hmm. something when I was getting beat by that mother? You know, and, and Clark's trying to do his own. It's like, hey, listen, that thing I gave you, I need it. No, we won't. And he hears an avalanche going on, and he takes off. And so then the assistant to him, uh, Lieutenant Anderson, goes, find out where he's going. Yeah. And sure enough, they kind of play into this as well. So they wind up luring Superman into a little bit of trap, which parallels the intro to the show. Yeah. So he's now getting captured by the U.S. government. And this isn't Anderson acting on his own because you remember um, right before one of the commercial breaks, he got on the phone with a hot, someone higher up the he chain. He got somebody, yeah. He, they never said who it is, but he made a call to somebody high up the higher up the chain and said, hey, listen, blah, 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 you know, I need to do something to get, you know, Superman's not going to listen to us. I need to do something, but I need your approval. And they kind of cut to the commercial. It's like, oh, fuck, what are they going to do? Yeah, who's he calling? Yeah. And then sure enough, they lure him into the trap where he's he's fighting in the hallway. And it was am I wrong to say, like, okay, are we copying the Netflix Marvel shows? I mean, it we did. We got to have a fight in the hallway all the time here? It, it did cross my mind. Yeah, like I couldn't yeah. help it. But it was a great fight sequence, yeah. nevertheless. Did, you know, they kicked in some artificial red sunlight, you know, so he dampened it. So it dampened his powers. So he was fighting like a normal man. Still held his own. Still you know, held his own. Still held his own, but still got his ass kicked. Yeah, because Anderson whips out the kryptonite bullet. Yeah. And the kryptonite bullet just winds up taking Superman out. And and this was what infuriated me a little bit, and I alluded to when I was giving my like thoughts on the show. Anderson, you don't you want Superman to listen to you. You want him to help him out. You need to give him a reason to help you to help you. You've not done it to this point. Luring him there under false pretenses, turning on an artificial red sunlight, having your soldiers beat his ass, subdue him. And, oh, by the way, shooting him with a kryptonite bullet are all things that will not help your case. You want him to help you? You want him to work with you? You are doing the exact opposite. Well, see, he just doesn't get it. I mean, oh, but, I know. But, but that's how he plays. No, I agree with you. I agree with you fully because he thinks he can impose his will on Superman. And I realize I'm not the brightest bulb in the shed, but even I realize that's fucking dumb. Oh, yeah. I'm like, you are just provoking him. Oh, yeah. You want injustice to happen. Yeah. I'm just putting this out there. Anderson has a death wish. Clark might not grant it, but I'm sure Bizarro will. And yeah. somebody's going to wind up doing something. I have a feeling Anderson's not making it to the end of the season one way or another. Yeah. Because now he's arrested Superman for treason against the United States. Yeah, which that's, oh boy, that's a, that's a hefty uh, price for that, that charge. That's, yeah, that's going to get a little dicey as he's getting drug out with two kryptonite bullets in him. And they said they're going to reunite him with his brother. <laughs> The brain trust behind this government agency is severely lacking. Yeah, well, no, yeah. No, you, you, yeah. you can't sugarcoat it. We're going to put Superman yeah. with his brother that he barely can defeat yeah. behind bars. They're going to have a chit-chat, and you know Tal Rowe is going, okay, Clark, Like, listen, we've never really kind of seen eye to eye. You see what they're doing? Well, and you also got, and it also didn't cross my mind until just now, 
he also Anderson also still doesn't know where Bizarro is. Oh right. Bizarro, everything that harms Superman, I I would presume everything that harms Superman does not harm Bizarro because opposite. Right. Heat vision, ice vision. Ice breath, heat breath. In red sunlight, it basically takes away Clark's powers. Mm-hmm. What if for Bizarro it amplifies? Oh, it does. Them? So you got to figure it amplifies them. So if Bizarro figures out where he is, goes after him in a in a rescue attempt, like, hey, listen, I need your help to do this thing. I can't do it alone because reasons. Oh, hey, that Superman is there. He's just like Superman. Kick on the red light. Oops. Oh, you know it's going to happen because General Lane knows what happened to him. I'm going to freak like, out and enjoy if it happens. Seriously, get the popcorn ready because he is going to wind up killing he, everybody. He's going to run through there, everyone there like a wet paper, uh, like a wet piece of paper towel. Cue up the ultimate warrior music. He's going to come <laughs> flying down that hallway and just be beating the hell out of everybody in sight. Oh, it's going to happen. I'm going to be here for it. But, Pat, final thoughts on the episode? Great episode. Loved every bit of it, you know, from start to finish. Kudos to Amy Jo Johnson, the former Pink Power Ranger, uh, for directing a wonderful episode start to finish. Was not a point where, because uh, sometimes in some of the episodes I hit a plot point or the little, I'm like, all right, I don't really care about this. Let's get to something else. Had me entranced in watching every moment of this from start to finish. I fully agree. I did not look at the clock once no. watching this. And, like, not that I ever really do, but... I didn't realize the hour was over. I didn't. The only time I looked at the clock was when they had like the 8.30, 8.35 or, uh, commercial break, and I had to get up and go to the bathroom. And to that point, I hadn't looked and see what time it was, so I went up to go to the bathroom, and I looked at my watch, and I'm like, holy fuck, it's ha- episode's halfway over. Yeah, because that this episode was so captivating from point A to point B. Like, this was a great episode. Yeah. Like, cannot stress highly enough. Everybody needs to check this show out. And they, if you want prime example, this episode does it. This had a different feel than what we've seen thus far this season. Not slighting anybody else before. No. But this really brought out a lot of emotion. The action sequence, for a few and far between, but they still hit the points. And and none of the side stories that weren't Clark or Lois related felt forced. Right. It just felt natural. It's like, hey, we're here for a spell and we're moving on. Yeah, like I fully agree with you on this. I think that we got away from trying to force Jordan down everybody's throats. And the lowest conspiracy against the cult thing. Like, they teetered around it a little bit with Lucy, but that's what she needed to do. They discussed it, but you had to because given the, oh, past, sure. the past episodes. But they didn't go, hey, remember the, the cult we the cult we dealt with a couple episodes ago? Hey, remember the cult? Remember the cult? Yeah. I mean, it was it, like, hey, Ally, cult, reasons. They didn't pull the uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Hey, you remember the Avengers? Hey, remember the yeah. Avengers? Hey, remember the Avengers? Yeah. Which, ironically, next week's director of Superman and Lois, Elizabeth Henshridge. So much win to happen when the show ODPH Society hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPH pod. Superman and Lois, episode six of season two, tried and true. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the show. More people need to be watching this. Point blank, no questions asked. But let's discuss, shall we? We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Hey guys, my name is JT. What's up everyone? I'm Darren. Hey, what's up guys? I'm Josh. Hey guys, I'm Christian. Hey, what's up y'all? This is Dominic and we're the East Coast Avengers. We're a group of five friends who get together weekly and talk about everything that's going on in the nerd universe. Whether you're a fan of Marvel, DC, Star Wars, video games, comics, or anything else nerdy that you can think of, we're the podcast for you. You can find us on Anchor, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or whatever streaming platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts on. You can also catch us on our YouTube channel where we release tons of content such as vlogs, unboxings, TV and movie recaps, and trailer reactions. So if those things sound good to you, then check out the East Coast Avengers podcast. We hope you enjoy. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast. And let us take a trip to the land of the walking dead. Zombies! Yes. The second part of the final season has now entered the playing field. Mm-hmm. We're getting caught up on the adventures of Daryl Dixon and company and kind of how things are panning out since uh, it's been very, very messy. Yeah. To put it mildly. Yeah. Obviously, the debut, if you can call it that, or season premiere, I don't know. What, the return. You, yeah, however you want to find Return works. Uh, was a very interesting episode. Yeah. Uh, a lot of things happening that uh, are setting up some motions for Brave New World, which you know from the comics. So this episode, entitled New Haunts, definitely carried on that story. Uh, 
It's a lot of mixed feelings about this one, so Pat and I are going to deep dive into it. You know the deal by now. After the countdown, it's spoiler talk. So in three, two, one, Pad, what did you think? Thought it was an okay episode. You know, was expecting a little bit based off of the end of last week's episode where we had the six months later jump and Maggie's got a, a, a ruin on the ruins of Hilltop. You know, when the standoff, you got the Commonwealth soldiers are there and she says, you know, you don't have to do this. And the soldier pulls off his helmet and it's Daryl and he says, no, I have to. And it's like, oh, fuck, like, what the hell? You know, so I was expecting a little bit, you know, just because I wasn't sure if this is, hey, this is a flash forward as to where we're going to end up or if this is a flash forward in the sense of the time jump they did a couple seasons ago. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't sure what it was going to be, but a little let down in that instance, but the episode was all right otherwise. I agree with you. I was a little disappointed with this episode. Sure. Wasn't mad, but sure. I was, I'm sitting there going, okay, after last week and we saw the big standoff with Maggie and Daryl. I figured, okay, either we're going to get the background of how we got here. Sure. Which I think we are. Yeah. But we're taking the scenic route. Yeah, I, I fully anticipate that scene we saw last week isn't going to be the final shot of this portion of the season. It'll be in the final episode, but, like, whatever happens a little bit after that we will will be the final shot. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm fully with you on this. Like, you, we're going to see this later. Like, it's we're going to return to it at the beginning of yeah. the final chapter, yeah. eight episodes. Yeah. But for this one, we jump into where Daryl and some of the survivors have now gone to Alexandria or uh, Com the Commonwealth from yeah. Alexandria, and they're now being evaluated by the community. It's kind of an odd thing, yeah. you know. It, it's it's interesting to see how this is all playing out because it looks like they're part of a Halloween fair. Yeah, there's a Halloween's going on. You see kids dressed up doing a kind of trick or treat. It's not full blown trick or treat. There's a but you got a costume contest going on where they're handing out prizes and all that. Which is, and I know we were watching the episode together. I said to you, I'm like, this is odd. Yes. Just because zombie apocalypse, everyone's been in fear for however many years this has been going on, but you're just casually having kids walk around the street. Like nothing's going on. Like, oh, everything's hunky dory. Like it's a day at Disneyland. But that's the appeal of the co of the Commonwealth. Yeah. That it's a return to normalcy. and Or as normal as you can get these days. Right. But it's something that they're really selling to everybody that here's the dream. Like we're back to normal. Everything's great. And you're seeing how everybody's kind of interacting with it and seeing how the town is accepting of the new members. Yeah. And it's it's a it's kind of a slower paced beginning. Though, yeah. Because you're really trying to piece together, okay, what's going on here? Yeah. And you're seeing everybody is like either like Daryl's going through the town and really getting the feel of the place to it, it, it feels like the town is deliberately putting on their best face yeah. for this whole thing. It's, it's like if you ever work in a, in a corporate setting or like a retail setting where, you know, the higher ups might come down to visit you at some point and it's like, Hey, we got to dress this up and do this and do that. It feels like that to a lesser degree. Like, Hey, we've got these new folks here. Let's put our best foot forward. Roll out the nice carpentry. Let's use the fine China yeah. type of thing. It's kind of a wild scenario with that, but you're right. And that's why I say like, it just seems too good to be true. Yeah. And as you're seeing how the other members are going through town, especially Carol, <laughs> who is baking cookies again. Oh, boy. Now, that didn't end good the last time, so nope. we're just giving fair warning to everybody else. But we do see her checking in on Ezekiel. And, yeah. you know, he is really, I think out of everybody, is the most comfortable in this situation. Oddly, yeah. It is. I mean, Kari Payton, who's been playing him since day one, has definitely embraced this role and is yeah. definitely feels like, Thing, like he's the one that acts the most comfortable and everything's back to normal. But Carol, though, is not buying it. And she's no. and she's causing more issues than not. I mean, Melissa McBride has been doing the role of Carol and, and giving us a lot of different layers to that character. Oh my god, yeah. And this time it's like she just fully is not buying this whole utopia. She she's seen enough and she's been around enough supposed utopias and wonderful places to be like, all right. This can be a fresh coat of paint over everything, but there's some shit going on here. Yeah, so she's like breaking into the hospitals there, getting records out on Ezekiel because she thinks she's li he's lying to her. Like there is just a lot of stuff going on with her that they touch upon that I know we're going to see more in the, in the episode. But she was just in the beginning of the show and then she was gone, yeah. which I thought was kind of interesting. Yeah, they spent a good majority of the episode though on Norman Reedus, yep, and Christian Cerritos, mm -hmm. and their whole deal. Of now being inducted into the strike force. Yeah, they like the armed services. Yeah. 
of the Commonwealth. And we're seeing how they get paired up with different people and basically how well do they work together. And yeah. Daryl is already saying, like, I don't want to work with this person. Give me this one. And yeah. Mercer is just not hearing it. <laughs> and Mercer's like, no, you're going to have to work with who I give you. And here yeah. we are. And, I mean, this whole path for Daryl makes the most sense because, let's face it, he's never taken from the time we've seen him on the show because we don't know how he was before the, the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. He's never one that's taken domesticated life very well. Yeah. You know, he's he's an action-oriented guy. He's always got to run around and do something. He's always got to stay active. So him doing this made sense. Oh, it absolutely did make sense. And you do see when he's paired up with the, his partner, ah, uh, the partner is not pulling the, his fair share away. Yeah, what do you mean? It goes perfectly fine. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's never not, mind the fact he fucks up. Yeah, he fucks up multiple times and nearly gets Daryl killed by a zombie because they're like, hey, we're going to test you on live zombies. Let's see how this works. Did it, did it, Yeah. Charge. And we do see that the one guy has to get bailed out by Daryl mm-hmm. until Mercer decides to shoot the zombie. And Daryl's like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, you didn't work as a team. Yeah. The weirdest team bonding exercise I think I've seen in recent memory. Yeah. Even though Rosita and her partner was doing fine. Like, yeah. they actually worked well together. Yeah. So this is going to play into something a little later as well. Because, like I say, they spent a good majority of the episode on this sequence. So then they kind of fast forward to... A gala at the end of the day. I believe it's like a masquerade type ball because everyone was wearing masks. Yeah, they're trying to do something like that. Yeah. And you do see the, the governor, Pamela, mm-hmm. is at the center of attention. Again, the- weird sequence because the apocalypse is still going on. There are still, you know, undead walking around that want to kill you. Yeah, Layla Robbins, who plays the governor, Pamela. I have to remember to say that because people I know. think it's not the real governor. Uh, she is playing this role very well. Like, she is just a full debutante Uh you know really kind of embracing the role of of being the upper class so to speak here and i think we even find out during this whole sequence that at one point she was the first daughter yes that we do find out her father was at one point pre pre the world going to shit uh was president at one time yeah so it's kind of a little wild backstory going on there and you do see that her son sebastian yeah who is the worst yeah i'm just putting this out there right now I've I've only had a couple minutes of him on screen time, and I'm just like I'm done with him already. Yeah, I, I cannot stand him. Given the kid, uh, one kid I forget his name uh, from Game of Thrones, a run for his money. Yeah, yeah, he's not Joffrey level yet, but he's he's approaching. Yeah, like ugh, he's the worst. So we are seeing though that Sebastian is not exactly too fond of Daryl and company, and is no. kind of really trying to really keep himself above him like in- well because the thing with sebastian is he comes off like that stereotypical you know oh holier than thou i know everything you don't i'm the veteran here despite what you know you're the rookie it doesn't matter what you learn here that's not the right way to do it and, and and in some instances when you run into that you show them what you know and they're like oh okay you do know some stuff let's work with that but in this instance he's daryl shows him what he can do and, and how hey i'm not an idiot i know what i'm doing and Sebastian just goes, you know what? Well, fuck you too. Yeah, like it's just a kind of wild play how they're doing this. Because there, because what is it? The, the, there's the one sequence where he tries to show Daryl how to kill a zombie or some shit, but he can't successfully pull it off, and it's very clear he's gonna die. Like it goes on for not a super extended long period of time, but long enough that you're like, okay, he's not gonna make it out of this unless somebody steps in right now to save him. Which Daryl does. Yeah, because Daryl... Daryl picks up his crossbow, shoots the zombie in the head, and and Sebastian looks at him and goes, What did you do that for? I had control of the situation. And I'm sitting there like, No, you fucking didn't. No, he's the worst. I hope he gets eaten sooner than later. But we do see, though, that there's a little break in the action here as well because Daryl does notice that there's a guy walking around serving drinks. Yeah. And he looks very familiar. Yeah, he does. Now, Pad, why does he look familiar? Because... He was part of the troops that originally came through Alexandria. Mm, that's right. So he's remembered as being one of the soldiers there. And he's trying desperately to talk to the governor and not getting any opportunity. Yeah. So he literally takes matters into his own hands. Yeah. Uh, the governor starts giving a speech, and it's well, it's a typical politician speech. Look yeah. at how great everything is. Thank you. This is all the hard work of you. Yeah, blah, blah. You know, all that stuff. And he this this dude you know i believe the guy's name is uh tyler tyler goes hey this is bullshit see through the lies 
and he goes and I think it was uh you know the governor's assistant se- assistant her secretary well whoever she is yeah you know and captures her and has a knife to her throat mm-hmm. with the room full of armed soldiers he brought a knife to a gunfight yeah like you don't this, do it this was not going to end well from point A to point B he does let the hostage go and then he escapes into the fun house that was made yeah Daryl goes and chases him yep and captures him yep which is kind of a little crazy because. The guy was ready to slit his throat. Yeah, he was. I, re- think, I think he was going for his carotid artery. Yeah, and Daryl talks him out of it and gets him to come back with him peacefully. Albeit, though, when he gets back there, he says, "Well, Sebastian did the work and, yep. and allows him." Which I'm like, okay, this is a weird play, but I think it's just Daryl. It's, cal- it's a calculated move. Yeah, Daryl's trying to get more dirt on Sebastian. Which, yeah. listen, more power to you because the sooner that guy's gone, the better. And then we gotta get a little fast forward to where Daryl is now with the group, and so is Rosita. Yep. And they're and you do have this cool music montage, which one thing that you have to remember, and I do applaud this about The Walking Dead, they love Motorhead. Yeah, they do. i and anytime the Dixons are playing some music, it's always Motorhead. I need a backstory about this when they do the anthology show. Maybe they were roadies. I listen. Give it to me. Oh, it, oh, oh we'll talk about that off air. But we do see the sequence where they're playing uh, Eat the Rich. Yep. And sure enough, you're seeing Rosita and some people going through and investigating some of the uh, warehouse or Yeah, you gotta figure you gotta figure by. you gotta figure they got some information out of Tyler. To- who knows, probably tortured him, you know. Oh sure. Interrogated him just to get some information about what was going because he said there because one of the things he did say before while they were taking him away is he goes I, he said something to the effect that I'm paraphrasing. I'm not the only one. There are a thousand of us out there who think like me. And I think it even got brought up to um, the the governor that, you know, Governor Pamela, that she's like, oh, do you think that's true? And they're like, no, it can't possibly be true. Which, you know, they're probably not buying that for oh, a second. The, well, that's the whole thing. I think at this stage, the people that are running the Commonwealth have rose-colored glasses. Yeah, or they know that shit's about to hit the fan. Yeah, or, they, or, they, or there's a dark side that we have not discovered yet. But Rosita does, because she finds some propaganda yeah. that is supporting the fight back against the Commonwealth. And that's how the show ends. Yeah. So, Pat, final thoughts on this episode? Not the greatest episode, but I still enjoyed it. You know, a little let down because I thought it'd be a build-off of what happened at the end of last episode, but it ended up not being. But I still enjoyed it. It was all right. No, I agree with you, too. This was not my favorite episode by any means. They took a long time with Daryl and Rosita in the military-esque training. Yeah. Whatever, whatever you wanted to find that force, whether it's the police force for them or whatever yeah. the, for the Commonwealth. They took a long time there, and then even the masquerade ball was kind of dragging a little bit. Yeah. Because I think that they were trying to establish like, oh, well, you know, this is a normal day in the Commonwealth. And I was like, no, it it shouldn't be. And it seemed like everybody had their own agendas going on. It was just kind of a little convoluted in my opinion. But not a bad episode because I'm still waiting to see where we're going next week. Uh, I believe a familiar face is directing. Is that right, Pat? Yeah, that's uh, one Michael Cutlets, a.k.a. Abraham. Yeah, so excited. Not the first time. No, not the first time, but it's been a while since we've seen him direct. So I'm super excited to see what he can do at the show. And definitely, I want to have that conversation with you, ODPH Society. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH Pod. The Walking Dead, Episode 10, New Haunts. Let's discuss, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got for those one-shots? Got a couple of things to talk about. Uh, the first of which is some unfortunate news. The last remaining uh, immediate child of J.R.R. Tolkien has passed away at the age of 92. That would be his daughter, Priscilla Tolkien. Uh, reading from an article on uh, the one ring.net, it reads, quote, Born June 18th, 1929, Priscilla was the only daughter of the professor and his wife, Edith. They were already living in Oxford when she was born. At the age of 14, Priscilla typed up some of the early chapters of The Lord of the Rings for her father. She studied English at Lady Margaret Hall College in Oxford, who yesterday announced her passing. 
Priscilla, like her older brother Christopher, was a champion of her father's work. She was vice president of the Tolkien Society, and together with the oldest of the four children, her brother John, she published in 1992 the Tolkien family album. Frodo's name in early drafts of Lord of the Rings, Bingo Bulger Baggins, apparently came from her uh, from her names for a family of toy bears she had as a child. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so unfortunate passing. So there are still obviously grandkids and great grandkids alive, but of the immediate children that uh, the professor J.R.R. Tolkien and his wife had, the last one has unfortunately passed. And to everything she and her siblings and her father did, I have a very hearty thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Our condolences out to their family, friends, and fans. Uh, moving on to some other news, and frankly, some very surprising news. Uh, it was announced uh, by the folks over at Marvel and uh, Disney that starting on March 16th, the Netflix live-action shows and, and also Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Will, About damn time. will be available on Disney Plus in certain areas, not all of them. Uh, so that means on March 16th, Daredevil, Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, The Defenders... Agents of the Shield and The Punisher are going to be added to Disney Plus at the same time. Now, uh, you might be sitting here going, Pat, Punisher is very, very violent. How are they going to be adding any of these to Disney Plus? You are reading my mind. That was what I was about to say. Glad you asked that. Uh, that is because Disney Plus will be rolling out new parental controls oh. in order to help people prevent their kids <laughs> from seeing. Yeah, so there's that whole sequence where Kingpin and a man's head with a car door. Yeah, yeah. That's to prevent kids from seeing that. Although, let's face it, kids are smart these days. They'll probably figure out how to get around the parental controls. Just saying. Oh, my God. But so, yeah, that's how Disney Plus is doing it, which would then lead you to believe if they're doing this, that would make way for Logan and possibly Deadpool getting added on there at some point. Who knows? Uh, so, I, as I mentioned, this is not everywhere. This is certain areas, and those areas include the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, and Disney did promise that the shows will be added to other Disney Plus territories later this year. So definitely a very, very big surprise because it was only, Christ, at this point as we record two days ago that they finally left Netflix, the Netflix shows. Uh, and hey, we didn't have to wait real long to figure out where they are. Okay, so initial reaction. One, love this. About time Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is on there too. Season four. If you watch anything in this world, you watch season four of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., damn it. And the episode that happened the week after uh, Winter Soldier dropped. Yes. That's the best part to start if you're going to start. And I highly recommend you do. But season four. I digress. Okay. So, one. I've already said. Two. I feel my unofficial ODPH guess that when we see Echo... Uh huh. The show, which we know is coming. Yep. I think we're going to see a lot more of those defenders pop up. Probably. Now, am I saying is it going to be everybody? No. I'm no. going to say it right now. I do feel in my gut you might see a Luke Cage. Yeah. You might see a Jessica Jones. Yeah. I tell you what, if they show up with Frank Castle. Oh, shit. I'm Burns just. all has said he will do it, but it has to be for the right story. And they have to do the character justice. Well, I think they will, but like here's where it's very interesting about that because I think he he is coming back. I don't, there's no question about that, and it just depends on what story they want to do, like you touched upon. But I think though, if they try saying, "Hey, if you can come to the MCU, we'll pair you in a movie with or Charlie Cox, we'll do something there. You can come in and just be like a side character." I think he does it. Do I think we'll have a full blown Punisher series? Not at the moment. They'll set one up, though. But they'll set one up. And plus, we have to remember, and just hear me out. We know that new series is coming out in the comics where he's the head of the hand. Yes, yes. I would say this. If, and I'm stressing if, that takes off. Like, let's mm-hmm. say that that's very successful. And, I, yeah, and yeah. you know, the creative team behind it, I think that's a that's a solid bet. Yeah. That's not to say that they wouldn't try rolling that into a show. I could see it. And you know what? He might, that might be something to interest him per se, because if you get the chance to be in the MCU, okay, like it's one thing if you're doing the Netflix shows. Yeah. Because hey, at that point, it was all connected. But if they go, you got one shot to be in this, mm-hmm. this writes itself. Yeah. So I think it just depends on that. 
Yeah. And I think we'll start seeing more people there because I think the fact that they have announced that these shows are coming. Yeah. And you know that Marvel and Disney are very particular about what they say is in canon and what's not. Sure. There's no way they would bring these shows over if they weren't going to be involved somehow. Am I saying everybody? No. But I'm saying... Yeah. There, you, We will probably see people in Secret Invasion. I feel- The characters will be there. It's just a matter of who plays them because I think in some instances they might not have any urge. And, and I'm not going to speak for anybody because I, sure. I don't know what they're thinking. But I think for some people, they're going to be like, yeah, you know what? I just don't want to. I've moved on from that from my life. It's it's been long enough that I don't really feel associated to it anymore. But then there are going to be other folks, much like much like Patrick Stewart, who finally officially confirmed, yeah, okay, listen, it's out. I'm in Doctor Strange too. Who Patrick Stewart previously said, nope, I'm done playing the character. I'll never play the character again. And here we are, you know, however many years later since Logan came out that he's playing the character again. I think for some of those folks, it might be a similar thing. Like, hey, listen, this is the MCU. This is a real opportunity. I can't pass this up. Yeah, when the House of Mouse calls, man, it's tough to put that phone down. So I'm saying this. I think the fact that they made such a big public announcement about that and involving the shows that they did, I'm saying I wouldn't doubt we see them in some capacity in some of the next wave of Disney+. Plus, Or, of course, Doctor Strange 2, which is rumored to have everybody in it again. Yeah. Allegedly, we're in it. Yeah, I know. Which we haven't got our checks yet. I know. I'm, I listen. I'm looking at you guys, MCU. I know you listen to the podcast. I know somebody at Marvel for a fact. Shout out to you. Listens to us. I'm just saying. You know, you can slide it into us. Maybe at, they're still mad about the whole New York Comic Con thing in me. Oh, I know. Well, I know that one. Per, that one person, I believe, is. Yeah. We'll talk about that some other time. But nevertheless, yeah. Pat. Pat is. Uh, Made some friends down there. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah. But I. But to wrap that up, though, I think, though, this is a big thing. And I wouldn't doubt, too, Yeah. that they had some CGI to say that there were in the Avengers all the time. Maybe. Just like a small thing. You know, like at the end of WandaVision? There's, listen, I'll I'll keep an eye out, obviously, and if I see anything on social media, I'll be like, oh, okay, cool. But I'm not going to be one of these people who watches, like, every fucking No, no, no. Every a fucking episode every six months just to see if there's been anything added to Because I know somebody's going to do it. No, somebody's going to do it, and then we'll just retreat them. Yeah. Ah, work smarter, not harder. Exactly. Next. Uh, switching on to some more news. Uh, it was announced, of course, back in August last year that the uh, anime streaming giants Funimation and Crunchyroll would be merging together. How? We had no idea. They would say more news would come down the road. And hey, we're finally at that point in the road uh, where just the other day, on uh, just yesterday actually, as, as we record, it was announced that uh, they Funimation is being folded into its one-time rival Crunchyroll. And much like Goku and Vegeta and Dragon Ball... Z and Super a number of times have fused together. Crunchyroll and Funimation are fusing together. No, they're not getting some funky mashed up name like Vegito. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're not munching up, uh, mashing up Crunchyroll and Funimation. It's still going to be Crunchyroll, but uh, Funimation and so, it, its content will be merging into uh, Crunchyroll, but not all at once. Uh, so, reading from an article on IGN.com says, quote, more than 16,000 hours of anime has Jesus. has been added to Crunchyroll at no extra cost following the merger between the two that competed uh, that completed uh, in August last year. 80% of what Funimation calls its most popular series will be available on Crunchyroll by the end of March. That includes My Hero Academia, Tokyo Ghoul, Cowboy Bebop, and much more. You can see a full list of Funimation shows on Crunchyroll. Uh, they they link to that article, which I am showing Ken. This is the this is all the shit that got added to Crunchyroll from Funimation. Damn. It's a long ass fucking. Yeah, list. we ain't reading that off here. No, it's a long list. You can find it for yourself on the Crunchyroll website. It is a long ass list of stuff. Uh, but it goes on to say Funimation will continue to operate as normal for the time being, but the move tape makes clear uh, that Crunchyroll will be the main platform going forward and any new anime starting in spring 2022 will only be available on Crunchyroll. Funimation will only continue to update series already hosted on the service. The move will also bring Funimation's subsidiary uh, Wakanim and Crunchyroll's VRV into the core Crunchyroll subscription. CEO Colin Decker said, quote, when we bought Funimation and when we brought Funimation and Crunchyroll together last year, our top priority was to put fans first, unifying all of our brands and services under the Crunchyroll brand globally enables us to offer more value than ever before as we combine subs, dubs, simulcasts, library, music, movies, manga, all into one subscription. 
The new Crunchyroll is the realization of a dream, and we are grateful to the creators of anime and the millions of fans who have joined us in the making of the community what it is today. Close quote. Uh, so, yeah, this is a huge move. And listen, if you are an anime fan, there is absolutely no reason now for you to not get a Crunchyroll subscription. Because once this move takes place and everything from Funimation gets added over there, literally anything you're going to probably want to watch is over there. Like, it's not like the days of, like, finding a movie to watch mm -hmm. where you might have to jump. Like, I was going through watching the Terminator, the first three Terminator movies. The first one was on Amazon Prime. The second and third were on uh, Netflix. You know, if you want to watch the MCU, you've got most, almost all of them on Disney+, Plus. but you've got the Spider-Man ones are on Stars right now, I think, and Lord Almighty knows where the Hulk one is. You know, yeah. you know, and that's in, unless you count in the X-Men movies or if you want to add in the early Spider-Man movies, those are all over the goddamn place. You know, and much can be said for the Crunchyroll stuff. We're like, oh, hey, I'm a fan of this. Oh, you got to Google and find out which streaming service it's on. Not anymore. It's all going to be on Crunchyroll, and that's a win for anime fans. Yeah, this is. I got to go check my subscription. I have yeah. not. I've not been on in a little bit. I got to admit because I've been yeah. a little busy, but. Uh, yeah. That is huge. Oh, yeah. And, and any questions you got about if you're a Funimation, you know, subscriber, I'm sure there's an FAQ page on both parties' site where you can figure it out or you can hit them up on a contact page. Yeah, that's what, that's going to be my plan because that is so much oh, it's an, right oh, it's an, oh, it's insane. There's going to be so much on Crunchyroll. You're not going to want to know what to do with yourself. Yeah, it's going to be wild. Switching over to some movie news, uh, Jason Momoa has confirmed that, yes, he is, in fact, going to be the villain in the Fast and Furious 10 film. Uh, he did an interview with Entertainment Weekly about his new role, and, yeah, he confirmed it, saying, quote, I'm going to go do Fast 10. That's going to be fun. It's fun. I get to play the bad guy, which I haven't gotten to do for a while now. Now I get to be a bad boy, a very flamboyant bad boy, the actor said. Uh, so that's no surprise. Most of the new actors and actresses uh, who show up in the Fast and Furious franchise who are you know new to the franchise usually play, listen, there's a formula that the Fast and Furious franchise, you show up as the villain, you make it to the end, and then all of a sudden you become family. You know, so Jason Momoa will become family uh, for at least this film. So it should be, well, well, films, I should say, because it's split into two parts, right? Yeah, because they're going back in time. See, that's my whole thing. They're going back in time. We're going to have Crisis on Infinite Diesels. We're going to go back through and see the career of Vin Diesel. Xander Cage. We're getting Xander Cage. We're getting Bloodshot. Oh, God. We're going to make this happen because it's all about family. Family. And then we might have, maybe maybe he's actually playing Aquaman. And Aquaman is the real villain because he's going to say, no, we're not going to let you in the DCU. <laughs> Stay out. Oh, my God. Make it happen, damn it. Uh, switching to uh, some uh, more streaming news. Listen, folks, put your pitchforks and torches down. Uh, Bendergate is officially over. Uh, John DiMaggio is officially returning to the Futurama franchise. Uh, according to Deadline, DiMaggio has signed on to return to Futurama with the upcoming 20-episode uh, revival. He is going to be voicing Bender, uh, one character known for a lot of ne'er-do-well and, and absolute terrible behavior yeah uh so this means the entire original voice cast is returning for the series franchise which i know is something uh a lot of folks were kind of hanging their head out with their head on like hey i want to see it but i don't want to see it if not all the cast is there you know he did a, a post to his twitter account i'm back baby uh hashtag bender gate is officially over so put it on the back of a shelf behind xmas decorations or maybe in the kitchen drawer with all the other crap you put in there like the old usable crazy glue or maybe even put it in a jar you save farts in whatever floats your boat i don't care you get the picture i'm back baby bite my shiny metal ass close quote so no, i'm happy he's back because it would have been wrong and weird to have the cast back except for him and have somebody else voicing the character it just would have been wrong. But at the same token, I hate the circumstances that led to it. I just hate I, I don't hate one person more than the other. I hate everybody in this instance. I hate the fact that it had to get to this point and we had to make a hashtag and petitions just to get him back on the damn show. I hate it, but I'm glad he's back. Yeah, I'm with you. It's, it's just messy, but... We won't be talking about that as soon as the episodes drop. No, absolutely not. And then speaking of things dropping, tomorrow, uh, as we record, March 3rd, a se second season of a show I am very much excited to watch is returning to Paramount+. Plus, and that is season two of Picard. Uh, so this is uh, launching Paramount+. Plus, uh, and what we know about uh, season two is uh, reading from an article on Inverse.com. Uh, says, quote, Jean-Luc Picard's past once again haunts him in the forms of... Jean Delance's Q and Annie Worshing's Borg Queen. In season two, he travels back to Earth to the year 2024 in a 
an attempt to unravel pivotal events that have devastating consequences for the galaxy. So mm. if you're a fan of Star Trek The Next Generation, you know who Q is. He's an absolute thorn in the side of Jean-Luc Picard. So when the when you heard his voice in the initial teaser trailer, every fan, myself included, went, ah, son of a bitch. Yeah. You know, so a lot absolutely love season two when uh Paramount Plus law I did not watch it when it was CBS All Access because I just had no urge to. Mm-hmm. Paramount Plus launched and they had all the great content, so I signed up for it. I binge watched the entire show in like two weeks or something like that. Loved season one. Season one's a lot of fun. It's a it's a quick watch. Season two should be even more fun. I am super excited for this. I cannot wait for it to drop uh, tomorrow. Yeah, I got to go check this out. I'm behind on that stuff. I just Life has been crazy lately. Sure. But I do have Paramount Plus. My mom, yeah. I got it for her so we could kind of share yeah. the account. Because she loves Yellowstone. Oh, sure. My parents do, too. Oh, my. Yeah. Like, I've, oh, I, yeah. I, I, I haven't started it yet. But sure. I, I popped in for a couple episodes. I can I can understand why people. Love oh, I've it. I've seen a couple too. Yeah. So that is uh, something I've been meaning to check, and obviously Picard man doing his thing. Yeah. I mean seriously, I never thought that show would take off as well as it did. Yeah. Like I thought it'd be like good for a one and done, but you know here we are. How many yeah. seasons now? Well, uh, this is on season two now. Okay. Why am I thinking season three? I don't know, but no, yeah, it's only season two. So yeah, season one was in 2019, so maybe that's why it's been, maybe that's why because it's, it's been a while. It's been a while, yeah, but pandemic and all that stuff. Yeah, it throws all my game off. Yeah. So going to my one shots, uh, let's see. Going on this Friday, actually, on Amazon Prime Video. Yep. The Boys Diabolical. Oh shit. So this is going to be an animated series set in the world of the boys. There's a lot of cool people behind this. I have got to see it as an early screener. Okay. If you love the boys, you will love the show. I'm going. I don't want to spoil anything right now. I'm going to just say this, Pad. You love the boys. Yes, I do. You definitely want to go watch this. Okay. When it drops on March 4th, so definitely make a point to see it. Uh, it's wild. It's crazy, but it's fantastic. And there's a lot to love about it. So I definitely want to interact with everybody after that when it drops. Yeah. At the comic shops this week. There's one book that is jumping out to me that I definitely want to plug, uh-huh. and that is the one only Rogue Son. Oh, yeah. Ryan Parrott. I, I, can we call him friend of the show? Because he follows you on Twitter. I would say so, yes. So this is the book that is uh, sp- spinning out of the events of Supermassive, which if you haven't picked up yet, shame on you. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Shame on you. Go get it. And go get this issue of Rogue Son. Rogue Son is a very cool story. I don't want to spoil too much about it, but I'm just going to say this. If you love a good superhero coming of age slash mystery, yeah, this is going to be up your alley. Like he All does, right. they, the creative team behind this does a really solid job, and it definitely is something worthwhile to pick up. So I'm going to say, make sure to swing on over to the comic shops, go get yours. I have mine sitting in at the LCES, and I definitely have read it on Comicsology. That's how much of a fan I am of this book. Nice, it's that good. So definitely make sure to go pick it up. And last but not least. You know it's Batman week. Yeah, it is. So, obviously, the epic by Matt Reeves starring Robert Pattinson and a whole slew of other people is hitting the movie theaters this so week. you got Robert Pattinson, Paul Dano, Zoe Kravitz, Colin Farrell, Andy Serkis, Jeffrey Wright, just to name a few. Yes. And, obviously, this is going to be a fresh take on The Batman. Getting rave reviews. Yes. The reviews have been great. Projected to make somewhere between 100 and $125 million opening weekend. Yes. Which is a fuck ton of money. It is. And especially at this day and age where we've already had how many Batman films? Uh, not even films. It's just actors playing Batman. Yeah. Jesus. With Matt Reeves, who made me care about the Planet of the Apes franchise. Yeah. That has really made me pay attention to this film. Yeah. And this is going to combine elements of year one, the long Halloween, in my opinion. And also, it's not going to be an origin story. Thank fucking God. Yes. Listen, I love the Batman story. I love the origin. I love the whole thing. I don't need to see it on screen every time you do another fucking take. Yeah, we don't need to hear the safe word, Martha, at least for another movie. I'm just saying. Yeah. But this one, though, the take they're doing, this feels like a horror movie. Yeah. I'm super excited to see how this plays out. It's very grounded. I know the only thing that I've seen that I haven't really fallen in love with, so to speak, is like he's walking around with that bulletproof armor, taking machine guns right to the gut. Sure. And just walking it off. But I am excited for this, and I have already heard they're kind of talking sequels, so I don't know if this is all going to be a trilogy. I mean, the one thing I'm excited for this is we do know we are getting the spinoff TV show, I guess you could say, of uh, Colin Farrell playing Penguin. 
I'm ex- listen. I I was on the fence about this, and much in the same way I was on the fence about Peacemaker because I was like, I don't know how this. But I look at the how fantastic Peacemaker was, and I turned around and went, All right, you're doing you did that for Peacemaker as a spinoff of Suicide the Suicide Squad. Give me fucking Penguin if you're going to do it anything like that, or if it's going to be as brilliant as that was, please. Yes, absolutely. So everything is lined up for this. Early predictions, I think that they're going to set up with a nice cliffhanger. Probably. And I think that we're going to go into, I don't know if they would time jump with this. I think that they should keep it right around the same timeline. Well, and it sounds like they're going to keep it fairly well contained because I I thought I saw a quote the other day with Matt Reeves saying he doesn't want Superman to show up in in this universe anytime. So I was like, all right, I'm fine with that. Well, and that's perfectly fine. I think the one thing that with DC is you can do movies like Batman vs. Superman and have somebody else play Batman. Sure. And keep it the Snyderverse or whatever you want to define it as. But if some director wants to keep it self grounded, that's perfectly fine. We don't. There's a, there's room for that. Yeah, you don't need to have everybody in a shared universe. I mean, Marvel did it, but that was Marvel's plan since day one. So okay, that makes sense. DC didn't for reasons. It's okay. Yeah. The problem that you're going to have if you try forcing in Superman there, unless it feels organic, it's going to be a waste of time for what Matt Reeves is doing. He's such a good director that he has got his vision planned out, and I'm sure that they got three films lined up at least a rough draft. And how this movie shapes up, too. You're really having people interested into the Riddler. You're really having some characters that you wouldn't necessarily would work on a big screen, per se, but they're making it happen because they're keeping yeah. it well-grounded. Like That's the one thing that you can't stress enough. This is going to be a very grounded series, a la the Christopher Nolan's trilogy. Yeah. But it's an own take, too. And plus, with a young, inexperienced Batman, yeah, I think that's going to be the cool point, too, because he's going to be using a lot more of his detective skills. Which we really haven't seen a lot of in the movies. Not not a lot. Not a not a tremendous amount. But this is where I think he's going to start shining in with it. We are going to be at the theaters on opening night. Yeah. I mean, unless you've gone to IMAX, which I don't want to talk to you right now. I'm super jealous. But if we are going to be there, we're going to definitely be talking about it in full spoiler mode next week. So you definitely want to make sure you tune in in for that. And you know the social media embargo is up for us as well. We will start posting uh, any spoiler talk on socials starting Sunday, uh, March 6th. Yep. So nothing in the meantime. Don't ruin it for anybody else, too. There's a lot of people that are trying to go see this. Don't be that person and ruin everything for them. Be fans. Be passionate fans about it. We can definitely have those conversations spoiler-free about this as well. And let's all enjoy the movie, shall we? Yeah. Because we're going to be down there with the whole 607 Podcast fam. 3FN is going to be down there. Lincoln's swinging down through. Johnny Moose is going to grace us with his presence as well from Excite Wrestling. So it's going to be a fun time. So definitely well, let's talk about it after the movie and just give us your thoughts too. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Let's do that for this week. What is the opinion of the Batman? Are you excited or are you not? Let's talk about it. That all being said, the music you heard on this episode of the ODPH is that a shout of the robots. They're super excited about it, Pad. Oh, I bet. Ped, but if I want to find out about the show, where do I go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Swing it over to the music section. Check out everything I want to shout. Everything I want to Tom Joe, Yard Party, Brian Wolf, Floodlands, Second Suit. The list goes on and on. I keep forgetting. That's why I te- keep telling you people, go check it. Also, while you're at the website, go check out the directory. Which, Pat, how many providers are we on? Uh, 10,502. Correct. So if we're not on your favorite podcast provider, I don't know what to tell you. Because, you know, we're on so many. Let us know who we're not on, and we'll see about getting that fixed for you. That's how much we care about your listenership here, and we're so very appreciative of that. Also, while you're at the website, check out the Classified section, which has organizational links supporting Black Lives Matter. All the friends of the show, such as Excite Wrestling, such as Dragon Master Games, such as 8122 Productions, and all everything they got going on on their Patreon, which you should be signing up for. I'm just putting it out there. Uh And all the amazing pod groups we're in via their Podchaser pages. So shout out to the Inner Circle. Shout out to the Apocalypse, And, of course, shout out to 607 Podcasts. Also on the website, Parlay Points. So you want to talk some blogs, we got the blogs for you. In fact, maybe, just maybe, because it came in super late, I might sneak out a Parlay Point this week. Just going to say, maybe it's going to happen, because we do have a new press affiliate, too. Very excited about that, Pat. Yeah. And, of course, the T-Public store. I can't stress that enough. You want to get that OEPH swag. You want to get that Pad's deal in shirt flying off the shelves. Make sure you swing on over to do that. All that and so much more, ODPHpodcast.com. That's all I got for this week. So we're the one only Pedal 1J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Go see the Batman, and we'll see you next time.